Hello everyone. Welcome to the Introduction to Humanities, Humanities 101. Over the next 15 weeks we're going to take a look at the humanities which is really defined as the study of human creativity. This discipline involves many other disciplines including philosophy, history, social sciences, arts, literature, music, theater, drama, and on and on. What defines something as humanities is that it's not as measurable or quantifiable, that it involves the feeling aspect of the human nature, or really just regards the, its uh, relating to the arts rather than the hard sciences and mathematics, which uh, involve more objectivity, more hardly definable, quantifiable, facts. Now the arts, the humanities, they're not quite as easy to define. But before we get into all that, let me take a moment and introduce myself to all of you. Hi everybody! My name is Cynthia Dollard and I'll be your instructor for the next 15 weeks. I am talking to you now from my art studio in the Ozark Mountains where I live uh, nearby. I also teach studio classes at North Arkansas College. So here's my face. This is me. This is where I'm working from. So maybe that'll help you when you want to visualize the human being behind the class. But there's going to be days, I think, where you need a little bit of something to liven up your course experience. So I invite you to consider visualizing me in a slightly different fashion, which I will show to you now. Okay, here we go. Okay, here I am. You see the likeness? This is called Self-Portrait as an Ella Human. I did it a few years back, but I think it does capture, you know, certain days when maybe I'm feeling a little bit more self-important than is wise or if, if I just really need a good laugh. You know, I'm a big believer in that humor is uh, key to a happy life, and so whenever possible, I like to view world, the world from kind of an alternative, humorous perspective. Now this is one way, and it's kind of just my jokey thing, but here's another. This is really more about my life, too. Here we go. Here's a painting of my home, and it's a few years old. It's probably five or, ten, five or seven years ago, but this is my cabin in the forest with a couple of my furry, four-legged friends. So now, I, as they say, that's probably about enough about me. Although, I will tell you a little bit about what I bring to this study. The arts and music and theater and performance has been integral to my life for my entire life. I'm a real believer in those less quantifiable, less measurable aspects of our lives that really increase the quality of our lives. And I feel that um, sometimes when one is viewing the world from a purely rational, objective, uh, measurable point of view, that this can seem as, uh, I don't know, fluff or not necessary. But in reality, the arts uh, only were recently separated from, say, mainstream culture. Up until about 150 years ago, artists and artisans were just as central to life as were the miller and the farmer and all the other uh, people that work together to make society function. So I guess one of the things that I aim to do is to bring the arts in all their forms, and I say that word broadly, to bring all of them back into mainstream humanity, at least for those people who I'm able to work with as an instructor. So now let's talk a little bit more about chapter one, shall we? So, we've already defined humanities as the basic study of human creativity. We can also say that it's, it, it really enhances our quality of life. How do we express ourselves? Is that expression authentic? And I guess I, I really do feel that today in our society, when we're just inundated with so many images and points of view and ways of looking at things through the media that it's really nice to take some time and explore what is your feeling about this? Do you like it? Do you not? Tell me why. Not because of what someone else said or because of what popular culture says, 
but because of who you are in your own unique form. Um, one of the things that they say about humanities in our text that I've found quite interesting is that the study of humanities involves the sensitive aspect of our being. Now some people I know consider themselves to be uh, sensitive. I would actually put myself in that camp. Um, some people less so. But what does that really mean? In our text they define that as perceiving with insight. In other words, insight. One might look a little bit more deeply into something in order to uh, have a, a broader understanding of it. And that's what we seek to do with our study of humanities. Um, one of the things also that they said in our text that could almost be problematic, I think, for some of you, was that the study of humanities involves our feeling nature. And to some people, that's just kind of mm, not so necessary. But I think, having said that, almost everyone can be touched deeply, maybe with the birth of a child or with, um, uh, I don't know, one of those things in life, buying your first home, getting married, um, falling in love with a puppy, you know, we all have our ability to feel. And what the humanities do is they really seek to cultivate and touch that aspect. But it's not um, always in the way that is pleasant. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what we're talking about also in this is this uh, feeling and the believing that what we do makes a difference in the world. Now that's another uh, line from the text and I found it quite moving. Quite frankly, I very much believe that what I do makes a difference in the world. And throughout my life I've had the experience to have a wild dream or an idea and to pursue it and to watch it come to fruition. This is really how the creative process works and it speaks to the value of creativity in any society. So this is the kind of stuff that is just not so easy to measure as a math problem or a science scientific experiment with, ha with quantifiable results. But I would say that it is equally at least equally as important to the overall quality of one's life and the quality of society as a whole. What is important? What is important to each one of us as individuals? And how do we um, cultivate that which is most useful to us and, again, in my opinion, figure out how it can serve the greater whole? Now there's a word that they use so often in this text that I had to look up the thesaurus to find a different word and that word is values. They would say what has value to us? What do we value as hum human beings and what are our values? You know when I saw that for like the twelfth time I just pulled out my thesaurus and I looked for another word for that. And it, what I found was they would say the principles or the standards or even a moral code. But I think values is something different. What strikes at the core of our being as being true, as being genuine, authentic? That is what I think they are speaking to when they talk of values. So this human impulse to create art is ancient. It's really uh, been with us for time immemorial. And one of the things that they talk, um, do look at the cave paintings that are in the text. And uh, there's a video about Lascaux Cave, uh, which is just incredible. Um, but they, they talk about how art doesn't necessarily progress, you could say in a linear fashion. For example, the artwork that was created on the cave walls 30,000 years ago is not of a progressively lesser quality than that which was created by the Greeks. And what we have here is a Greek sculpture on the left from about 300 BC. And then about 300 years later, this is a sculpture called the Four Tetrarchs, which came along when Rome was kind of falling apart. But what you can see in the right hand sculpture is how all of the refinement that happened in classical Greek time uh, just fell away. 
And then when we got into the Middle Ages, especially in the early part after the millennium, art was very, very simplified. And I use that as an example for uh, how it's not necessarily that art gets better with time. In fact, it just continues to change. To me, that's what's most interesting is study how that change happens. Now, another thing that they say in the text is that strong art is not always pleasant and pretty. And some pleasant and pretty art is not always the strongest art. Now, here's an example. I hope I don't offend any of you, but this is, this is an artist whose work is often cited as being a favorite. And yet I often challenge the students who say that. This is fine decorative art. And this artist was extremely financially successful. In reality, much of the work was painted by people in his workshops. And uh, there was even um, neighborhoods that were in the theme of Thomas Kincaid. Now, I have actually researched him and found that his early work was quite uh, provocative and challenging. But he found something that really worked for him. And if this is one of your favorite artists, then that's just great. But in among artists, it's considered a little bit formulaic, like he follows a formula. And what I want to know is where is the challenge? So it feels good in some ways, maybe, to look at this and imagine this perfect place. But how, how does it make you think and grow? They say that one of the best ways, so here's an example, commercial success. He achieved incredible commercial success. However, he died quite young and um, had addiction problems and was perhaps not a happy artist, although he was quite successful. Now, the next artist that we're going to look at is from the text. And I'm going to admit <clears throat> that much as Thomas Kincaid is not my favorite, I would probably have this painting in my home before I would have this one. Because this is like, wow, this is... <clears throat> but if you know about David Sequeiros, he was part of a great school of Mexican mural painters that were active in the early part of the 20th century. And they actually created art that made significant change in their society. So what we're going to do now, uh, following the text, is we're going to look at three paintings that were created in the year 1937. Now this is in response to the Spanish Civil War, talking about, um, you know, obviously you can see the emotions there. This is like a, a desperate scream. Now let's move on and we'll look at another one from the year 1937, as Europe goes to, get, prepares to go to war. Now this is an artist's statement against fascism. So this is by Peter Bloom. It's a fascinating painting when you really uh, analyze it. Now, one of the points that they're making in the book with this chapter is to consider how once we learn about a piece of art, how that changes our perception. And I feel that this one is a very good example of that. You can't see in the back the, the black shirts, which were like the brown shirts, equivalent to Nazis, in the background. And here we have, as like a jack-in-the-box puppet, Mussolini, who founded fascism in Italy. And what this painting portrays in general is the city of Rome, called the Eternal City. And this artist is creating this as a protest as Europe heated up to a great war. And we have the uh, statues of antiquity in ruin. We have an old beggar woman. And then we have a figure of the Christ within a shrine. So this is an, uh, supposed to, you know, uh, get, evoke a strong response in the viewer, as is this one. Now when we look at the colors of this one, it, the colors and the whole way that it's painted so explicitly, it really gets that ugh response immediately. This one, not so much. It's got all the bright colors. You might just think of it as an illustration looks almost like a modern-day comic book illustration, and yet it was um, created as a political protest. Art as political protest has been used since time began, really. So now let's look at one more from 1937. You may have 
heard this, you may have seen this one and heard about it. It's called Guernica, and it's by the artist Pablo Picasso. Now, we study this one in all of my art classes because it is such a powerful piece. What happened was that during the Spanish Civil War, leading up to World War II, the Nazis had a new kind of bombing called saturation bombing. And they used it. They wanted to try it. Try it out. You know, see how it worked. So they tried out their new way of bombing on the city of Wernicke. And we don't really have an accurate account, but Pablo Picasso said that 5,000 people, innocent people, civilians, died. So in response to that, he painted this. And let's see, I think it's like 20 feet long, although I don't have the dimensions in front of me. It's huge. There's a quote in the book where a Nazi officer said, Did you paint that? And he said defiantly, No, you painted it meaning that they had done the atrocity which he was reacting to. So about this piece though, he did it for the World Expo 1938, World Expo in Paris. But when it was finished, it was too controversial and it had to be rolled up and sneaked out of Europe uh, into New York until far after the war. Now if you look at this also, you might say, but there's no color. He was a great artist, why is it in black and white? Well, Picasso said, because there is no color in such an atrocity. Now, let's move on here. Oh, and there's another one that's totally different from our text. But I have a slightly different version, and that would be the Mona Lisa. Now, I use the Mona Lisa in a lot of lectures because it's impossible to look at this piece objectively as if for the first time. And I just felt like putting this one in there so maybe it would, you know, I don't know something a little different but this piece is so widely known as um, you know a great work of art that we can't really judge it on its merits now in reality it very likely was cut down from a larger canvas as this artist has recreated here and uh, there's all sorts of myths about it which you may have heard um, but I what I like to present it is that we have art that evokes a strong response and then we have art that is just like it's almost like the picture of the picture that we all know now there's the next part in the text I'm going to ask you to simply read by yourself without me yakking about it because it's about poetry and read the E.E. E. Cummings poem which I will tell you the first time I read it I felt like huh I did not understand it but once you get the explanation, that's pretty cool. If you don't know E.E. E. Cummings, he uh, is an amazing kind of a modernist, early 20th century poet. And what he and mid, he worked in the mid 20th century also. But what he did very well was he broke all the rules, and he did this with great skill and um, created some beautiful, beautiful poetry. So read that. Read page 12 and 13 on your own. I found that the African poem was really quite moving as we look at the blend of cultures and how that worked in societies. And lastly, I do want to take a look at this Edward Hopper painting that's on the last page. They go through it quite uh, point by point and explain it and, and look at why it's so sad. But I invite you to look at the body of Edward Hopper's work. You could just do a search for Edward Hopper. And what you'll find is that it's all got that desolate aspect. He was someone who dealt with depression a lot in his life. And no matter what he paints, whether it's a gas station, one of his most famous paintings is called The Nighthawks, which is people in a diner late at night and they always just kind of feel a little sad and lonely and like there's it's a little chilly there's not that much warmth one thing that I liked about the explanation in the book and it's quite interesting every one of the uh, ways that this is put together for example the fact that there is this one window here that's blank that's an artistic choice, that there's this shadow here that's unexplained again. And why did he choose to lean this post just a little bit to the left? It gives it all kind of a feeling of um, some kind of a desolation or sadness. Now, we're going to look at all different kinds of art this semester. 
And as I read through chapter 2, which is for next week, I was struck by uh, how the, they're, they've chosen to use kind of provocative images. I would say that that's not an accident. So if you do find yourself having some kind of a reaction to the images that we've looked at today, or to the images in chapter 2, just know that that is really uh, means that it's successful art in some way even if it's not a fully positive reaction. And in this course, we're going to return to really the joy of creativity. People use art to protest, but they also use art to celebrate. And I, for one, believe that creating beauty that simply makes you feel good as a celebration, be that through song or theater or visual art or what have you, that's, that's a wonderful way that we can celebrate life. I also believe that art has a great power to get underneath the surface veils that we usually wear and to get to really our gut, you know, to, to evoke a very strong reaction. And that's something that I also celebrate. So this will complete the audio lecture for Chapter 1. And I really, again, want to welcome you all to class. And I do invite you to be patient if we have any hiccups over the next couple of weeks. I am adjusting to Canvas, as all of you are. It's my first semester to teach in Canvas. And also, uh, it's my first semester to teach this course. While I am really excited about it, and I honestly love this material, I'm learning the book. I'm reading the book along, you know, I'm one week ahead of you with the actual text. So. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. If anything is not crystal clear, then uh, please let me know, and I'll do my best to make this as fun and engaging a semester as possible. Thanks for listening.